Another challenge that arrives in modeling is when you have a model that is prohibitively difficult to, to solve by hand or to solve analytically. Most of the models that we've seen so far are linear models, which can be solved in a closed form manner. However, most real systems have, have nonlinear aspects to them um, that make their differential equations uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to solve analytically. And so a solution uh, to how to address these models or how to solve these models is to approximate their solution numerically. And this is what we will call simulation. This can also be useful even if we have a linear model, but the model is too complicated. Uh, for example, an entire vehicle model uh, with models of uh, many subsystems working together. Uh, such a such a model may be uh, too complicated to solve by hand, but again, it's something where we can approximate the solution numerically using simulation. So far in the course, we've already seen several examples of nonlinearities. Uh, one such example was wind drag, which tends to be proportional to velocity squared, so that's a nonlinear function. Uh, springs tend to be nonlinear. Um, especially if you extend them beyond a, a sort of a narrow range of deformation. Uh, Coulomb friction or the modeling of, of stiction is another example. Uh, another typical type of nonlinearity is something called saturation. So if we consider the horizontal axis to represent the input and the vertical axis to represent the output, um, you can imagine that most any physical system cannot generate sort of an infinite output. Any sort of actuator, any sort of amplifier will eventually saturate. Um, you know, if you have a motor and you supply it some voltage, eventually the torque or the speed of the motor will, will reach some limit. Another example uh, type of nonlinearity is called a dead zone. And an example of this in a motor uh, derives from stiction or from the Coulomb friction uh, type of, of model of friction. So here you can imagine that we're supplying some voltage to the motor, but the motor doesn't move initially. And that's basically because uh, the motor needs to generate a sufficient amount of torque to, to overcome this stiction friction before it will break free and start to move. And then a final type of example that, we'll, that we show here is something called backlash. Um, it's also uh, representative of, of a system that has hysteresis. So an example of this would be two gears that are meshing. So you can imagine that the two gears have some play. And so the input gear may move a little bit before it engages the output gear and starts to drive the output gear. And so that's something that perhaps you can sort of see here. So initially the input gear moves some before it causes the output gear to move. However, if you caused the, if you drove the input gear in the opposite direction, then it would have to again move a, cer a certain distance before it engaged the, the output gear again. And so that's what you sort of see here. Um, it's the idea that the system behaves differently uh, moving in one direction than it does in a different direction. As we said previously, when we have these nonlinearities present, it's difficult, if not impossible, to solve the differential equations analytically. So what we do is we try to approximate the solution. And so one very simple illustrative method is something called Euler's method. So here we have a derivative Recall that differential equations are simply equations that have derivatives in them. And so once one idea is to approximate the derivative as a finite difference. Uh, you know, graphically, what a, what a derivative represents is, is a rate of change or a slope. So it's the difference in the change in x between two discrete instances in time divided by the change in time. If we rearrange this, we can basically try and estimate 
the value of x, uh, some step t, delta t, into the future. So if I solve this equation for x of t plus delta t, I just multiply the delta t to the left-hand side. I get x dot of t times delta t, and then I add x of t to the other side, and I get this approximation. And we can use this to solve differential equations. Um, so let's say, for example, that this blue line is x of t. So this is the true solution of our differential equation. Um, we can't arrive at this analytically for some reason. Um, there's nonlinearities in our equation, or the equation's too complicated. And so what we do is we start from some initial condition, let's say x sub 0, and we use this approximation to try and estimate the value of x some step into the future. So at time t0, we know what x of t is. We know what the derivative is um, from our differential equation. Our differential equation, um, let's say, is x dot of t equal to something. And we're choosing some time step into the future. So if we apply this equation, we can estimate what the value of x is sometime into the future to give us an estimate of of the value of x at time t sub 1. This equation is basically a linear equation, and so we're sort of extrapolating, doing a linear extrapolation out into the future. From that estimate of x sub 1, we can then perform the same sort of uh, estimate. We have our estimate, we have our value of our derivative, we extrapolate some distance some time delta t out into the future to get an estimate of x sub 2. And we continue to do that. And we get some approximation of, of the graph x of t. Logically, you can see that the, you know, the true value of x of t, which is this solid blue line, is different than the approximation. But the hope is that, that our approximation can be sufficiently close to be useful. So looking at this, take a second and think about how we might be able to improve the accuracy of our numerical simulation, of our numerical approximation. So one way to improve the accuracy is to use a smaller time step. So to make the you know, the delta t smaller, the time between t0 and t1 smaller. Another way to, to make the solution more accurate is to use a higher order solver. So this Euler's method that we just used is what we call a first order solver. We're basically doing a linear extrapolation based on a, a single point in time. Higher order solvers exist, second order, third order, where we're not just using line segments, you're using you know, maybe parabolas or cubics, uh, using multiple instances of time to get a, a smoother, more accurate solution. So again, uh, take a second and think about uh, whether or not there would be any drawbacks to, to using these approaches to improve our accuracy. In general, the trade-off between using these approaches to get improved accuracy is that it'll take the simulation longer to run. This is a common trade-off. The thing that we always want to keep in the back of our mind is that if it takes our simulation one hour to simulate one second of time, then it's not very useful. Um, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to run very many simulations, get very much data. So one way to improve accuracy is to reduce the time step and use a higher order solver, which happens at the expense of making the simulation take longer to run. Other ways to improve accuracy is to improve the complexity of the models. And so this was something that we saw uh, when we were talking about the battery models, um, whether or not to use a simple resistive model, 
which is very easy to solve and would make the simulation run very fast, or whether or not we should use a dynamic model, a differential equation model of the battery. In general, um, some dynamics may be neglected, treated as static under certain conditions, um, such as if the, if the system is changing slowly or if um, the dynamics of that particular subsystem are very fast compared to the dynamics of the rest of the system. You can also uh, use lookup tables uh, instead of differential equation models. And these, these lookup tables or, or these maps could be based on steady state performance. So this is something that we discussed when we were looking at um, the torque speed curve of an electric motor. Or we could use uh, cycle averaged efficiencies. Um, for example, for an IC engine, instead of modeling the entire combustion process, you just look at the, the average efficiency over, over uh, a particular cycle. Most simulations will use some combination of these physics-based differential equation models and these empirically derived maps. And the, the sort of, you know, the trade-off is, is accuracy with, with speed with which the simulation can run. In general, the form of the model that you use will be determined by, by the purpose of your simulation and, and the requirements of the simulation. How accurate does the simulation need to be? What is it that you're trying to, what questions are you trying to answer from, from the simulation? At this point, we will also discuss ways to structure your simulation, in particular for, for larger systems. And so one way to structure your simulation is, is what we will call a backward looking simulation. And the way that, that this type of simulation is structured is you, is you start with the desired tractive effort, for example, from the drive schedule. So you have some urban drive schedule from the, from the EPA, and you basically just presume that that velocity profile is being met by the vehicle perfectly. And then based on that, you work backwards and you determine what is needed from the power plant, you know, the IC engine, the electric motor, to achieve that, that velocity. These types of simulations tend to run faster. They tend to make use of um, these empirical maps and lookup tables. The alternative is to use a forward-looking simulation. And so in this case, you know, you start with the drive schedule, but you don't presume that it's met. You basically have a driver model that generates actual inputs to the power plant. So based on the drive schedule, you have a model of the driver that generates some braking input, you know, some or some throttle input. Those are then applied to the power plant or the model of the braking system, which generates some torque. And then that torque is then applied to a model of the transmission. And then the output of the transmission uh, generates some torque, which is then applied to a model of the wheels and so forth. This type of simulation basically mimics the physical world. It's, uh, it's very useful for controls development, and it's very useful for hardware and the loop testing, which is what HIL stands for. So what I've stated so far describing these two simulation architectures may not be very clear, but on the next two slides, I'll try and give some examples. Some examples of commonly used simulations for electric vehicles and hybrid electric vehicles are the package, uh, which used to be called PSEP, which is now autonomy, which was generated by the Argonne National Labs, which is, uh, uses a forward-looking structure. To the simulation. There's also the uh, advisor simulation, which is generated by another national lab, NREL, the National Renewable Energies Laboratory, and it's it has aspects of backward-looking and forward-looking simulation, so we'll term it a, a hybrid sort of architecture. 
Here's an example of a backward looking simulation. Um, this may look familiar to you if you've taken the batteries course. Um, but the way that it works is it starts with an input from the drive schedule. Um, so basically this is generating uh, velocity outputs as, as a function of time. And then this velocity um, is supplied to this block and it's differentiated to get an acceleration. It's presumed that the vehicle is meeting these exact velocity and accelerations as, as provided by the drive schedule. So what's the power generated at the wheels in order to supply this level of acceleration and velocity? Uh, so this is a static model. Um, it basically uh, tacks on um, sort of the different road loads due to grade, uh, due to air drag, and determines how much power is needed to make the vehicle meet the drive schedule exactly. This power is then used to determine how much power needs to be drawn from the battery. And it uh, basically, this, this block consists of um, just a map uh, based on the efficiencies of the battery, just tacked on. And then based on the power that's being drawn from the battery, it determines how much current that corresponds to. And then it is used to, to estimate the state of charge of the battery, in essence, by integrating the current. And then it also is used to estimate the temperature of the battery and the values of various sort of parameters, the resistance, the state of charge, etc. This is a backward looking model. It, uh, it uses a lot of sort of static elements or empirical maps, but it does also use some physics based models. For example, the way that the temperature of the battery is estimated is using a differential equation model from first principles. This type of simulation, or this simulation in particular, runs very fast. Um, and it can be used to answer a lot of questions in terms of, in essence, maybe you're trying to size the battery, or maybe you're trying to determine sort of the efficiency of the vehicle. This would probably do well in those sorts of tasks. Here's an example of a forward-looking architecture. And so in this case, there is the drive schedule. Uh, the drive schedule is built in to this model of what we're saying is the preceding vehicle and this model of the driver. And so we're not presuming that the vehicle can, can actually meet the velocity and accelerations prescribed by the drive schedule. But what we're doing is we're we're modeling the driver and the driver is taking these sort of desired velocities as inputs. It's also taking uh, the distance of the current vehicle to the vehicle preceding it on the, on the highway. And based on those inputs, it's generating commands. Uh, so in this case, a throttle command where we're presuming that the brake command is zero. So this is just basically only modeling a, an acceleration so it takes this throttle command, and then it goes to a model of the throttle, which then goes to a model of the engine. So the throttle generates a throttle angle, which is an input to the engine. The engine generates a torque, and that goes to a model of the torque converter, which then generates a torque, which goes to a model of the wheels, and so on. And so the structure of this sort of mimics the structure of an actual physical vehicle, the flow of inputs and outputs. Each box may be modeled by a differential equation, a physics-based differential equation, but it may also use an empirical map. So for example, this engine is based on empirical, a map of empirical data. But this model is, is nice for a few things. So one thing is it's very uh, helpful in doing hardware in the loop testing. Since it mimics actual physical world, it's easy to sort of replace individual blocks by actual physical components. So you could imagine that this mathematical model of the engine is replaced by an actual physical engine. So this signal um, for throttle angle could be a voltage, you know, being sent to a motor on the throttle of a 
of a test bench. So this signal could generate a signal to an actual physical piece of hardware. Um, it can cause the engine you know, to move, and then you could have a sensor measuring the speed of the engine or the torque being generated by the, by the engine, and those sensor readings could then be supplied to another mathematical model. So, so this sort of forward-looking architecture is very nice for hardware and the loop testing. It's also uh, nice for controller development. So you can imagine um, if we had a, a controller on this engine or we were trying to design the engine controller, we would want it to sort of mimic the physical world. We would want it to take as inputs um, the same sort of inputs um, that, that it would take in the, in the real world and generate the same sorts of outputs. And it also allows us to assess sort of the dynamic, the dynamic performance of the system. You know, so if we're trying to assess, you know, what's the zero to 60 time or, you know, what is the comfort level of the driver, then we need this sort of more physics-based dynamic sort of modeling 